Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jorita Tensius. I'm a PhD student in the lab of Andrea Caviglia at Delft University of Technology. And today I will be presenting the work entitled Coherent Spin Wave Transport in an Antiferromagnet, in which we study the all optical detection and generation of propagating spin waves in an antiferromagnet. Now, uh, as many of you in this session might be aware, uh, current information processing is heavily based on the use of charged current, so charged particles moving through materials. However, especially when you scale this down to, to nanoscale nano sizes, this comes with dual heating, which is hard to uh, avoid and hard, uh, too hard to overcome, despite tremendous efforts, in, both in terms of, of time and money. Now, one of the proposals to, to, to overcome this, this uh, limitation is to use, instead of charged particles, to use waves or quasi-particles to transport information. And the idea is that besides the, the potential uh, advantage of lower dissipation, this also comes with an additional degree of freedom in which data can be encoded both in the wave, uh, in the amplitude and the phase of the wave. Now, uh, especially at this conference about magnetism, the quasi-particle uh, which attracts the most interest in this regard is the spin wave, the eigenmode of a uh, magnetically ordered medium. And, and all spin waves come with a certain dispersion relation, uh, which is the frequency as a function of the wave number. And, and this is highly tunable and, and also allows for nanometer sized waves. Now, in recent years, there has been a shift of focus or actually a broadening of focus to also include within this spin wave based computing uh, research field called magnonics to also include antiferromagnets. Um, so antiferromagnets consist of two oppositely oriented sublattices, so one pointing up and one pointing down, for example, and they're exchange coupled, which means that uh, as a result, they have uh, high intrinsic resonance frequencies. So already at the spin wave gap in the Brio end zone center, the frequency can be in the terahertz range. In addition to this, uh, the dispersion is linear, meaning that already at wavelengths of around 100 nanometers, uh, a limiting spin wave speed is reached, uh, which can be up to tens of kilometers per second and, and is much larger than the spin wave speed in, in ferromagnets in this regime. Now, most antiferromagnets are insulators, meaning that all uh, spin wave transport uh, is carried by spin waves and not by any uh, free carriers. And this spin transport has been studied over the last years in antiferromagnets, for example, in this work from 2018, uh, where the authors uh, use two metal electrodes depicted in yellow on top of an insulating antiferromagnet. And by sending a DC current through the metal electrode, uh, they generate spin accumula accumulation, and then uh, this generates spin diffusion through this insulating antiferromagnet. Um, so diffusive spin transport has been shown over macroscopic distances, and also in other works, uh, people have tried to uh, drive antiferromagnetic spin waves using uh, high frequency sources, but they all have in common that it's very hard um, to detect the wave-like nature of these spin waves. The, the, the coherence, coherency is lost. And, and the reason for this is, of course, the high frequency, which comes with intrinsic losses for sources at these frequencies. Now, the question is how to drive coherent, high-frequency antiferromagnetic spin waves. The solution has actually been around for quite some years already because instead of using this high frequency source, we can use an impulsive uh, broadband frequency source, for example, in the form of an ultra short pulse of light. And then by using a pump probe scheme, which you use a second ultra short pulse of light, uh, you can even uh, visualize the time evolution of the magnetic dynamics on the picosecond time scale. However, because of the small photon momentum, which I tried to depict by this, um, this bird in here, uh, the only, spin waves which are generated are close to the Brian zone center, so close to the uniform antiferromagnetic spin possession. Now in this particular work, which I'm presenting today, we try to bring this to the next step. So what we do, we show the optical generation and detection of coherent propagating spin waves in an antiferromagnet in this range of wave numbers where the wavelengths are around 100 nanometers. We do this by adding an extra ingredient to these pump probe experiments in which we use an ultra short pulse of light, but we use above band gap excitation in an antiferromagnet. So directly exciting charged transfer excitations uh, 
within the, the magnet, which are short-lived, meaning that they uh, still have their impulsive character. Now, in this way, due to optical absorption, you confine the excitation close to the surface. And when you have a confined excitation with a certain spatial profile, this comes with a broadband magnum wave packet in momentum space. And then this momentum wave packet, this starts to propagate into the sample away from the surface. Now, the first thing you need for such an experiment is, of course, an antiferromagnet, for which we use dysprosium orthophorite. Uh, the, the iron spins are antiferromagnetically ordered below an AL temperature of uh, 600 Kelvin. Um, and this uh, magnet is known for its strong magneto-optical properties and has been used in many um, ultra-fast magnetism works. Now, the optical properties of this material are similar to, to one of many charge transfer band gap uh, insulators. So there is very little absorption below the band gap. And then above the band gap of around 2.5 electron volt, the absorption rises quickly until it reaches values of, of 5 times 10 to the 5 inverse centimeters. And more importantly, this corresponds to penetration depths uh, of around 50 nanometers at 3 electron volts. But this is, means a very strong confinement of the excitation. Now, there are several ways to detect antiferromagnetic spin waves. Um, so the idea is the following. We excite the sample with these ultra short pulses of light with strong absorption. And then we can use below band gap uh, pulses, which are partly transmitted through the sample. And the rotation of the polarization plane of these pulses is proportional to a net magnetic component. And, and this is the detection geometry traditionally used for uh, zero wave numbers, uniform spin precession. Now, part of the propulse is also reflected. Uh, from the sample. And this reflected light can also carry a rotation of the polarization due to a magnetic component by Kerr rotation. Now, in this specific geometry, uh, the magnon wave packet, which cons consists of different spin waves, actually sets up uh, some sort of periodic modulation of the refractive index of the material, uh, which is then imprinted on this, on this propulse. Because of the wave number of the propuls and the angle of incidence, there is specific sensitivity to certain spin waves. It is very similar to Bragg reflection in a sense, or even to Brian light scattering, but then on a time resolved, uh, in a time resolved experiment. So these are the two experiments we're going to perform. So first we excite the sample with an ultra short pulse of light, which is strongly confined to the surface above band gap excitation. And then we look the transmitted probe light. And by changing the time delay between the probe pulse and the excitation, we get a time trace uh, of this polarization rotation, which oscillates at a certain frequency. And in this case, the frequency can be obtained by taking the Fourier transform and is around 175 gigahertz. Now at the specific temperature at which this was carried out, uh, this corresponds to uniform spin precession in this antiferromagnet. Now, by looking at the reflected probe light, uh, we also get an oscillatory signal in time. However, the frequency of this signal appears to be larger. So we're looking now at a 225 gigahertz signal, uh, which is almost 50 gigahertz larger. And again, with the idea of the specific geometries in mind, and also with the dispersion relation, we can easily explain this. So as I mentioned before, the first experiment is sensitive to a, to a uniform antiferromagnetic spin precession, so a spin wave with wave number zero, basically. And in this reflection geometry, we're actually probing a spin wave with a wavelength of around 140 nanometers, uh, which has a frequency which is around 50 gigahertz larger than the Bruen center, zone center magnum. So this is indeed a propagating spin wave in this antiferromagnet, generated and detected optically. So I, I argued before that if you have a spatially decaying excitation, uh, so larger close to the sample surface here at Z0, then decaying into the sample, then this should correspond to a broadband wave, magnon wave packet. However, so far we've only observed two specific uh, magnon modes in this wave packet. Now the question is, uh, can we uh, detect more magnons in this wave packet? Can we support these claims? 
And, and actually we can, by looking at the specific wavelength selectivity or wave number selectivity that we, we, we have. So we're changing uh, this, this detection equality, basically we're changing the wave number of the propuls or the angle of incidence, which I tried to depict in this schematic at the bottom, we actually obtain selectivity and sensitivity to different spin waves. And indeed, if we perform the experiment, which I showed before in this geometry, but then with different parameters for the wave number, angle of incidence and the wave number, and then we show the frequency as function of these wave numbers, we actually get frequencies which lie very closely and very well on the known dispersion relation of this antiferromagnet. So by changing these parameters, we can really map out part of the dispersion uh, in this experiment. Uh, and, and the smallest wavelengths are, are down to around 120 uh, nanometers. Now with this dispersion in mind, we can also look at the velocity which these spin waves should have. So if we take the derivative to, to obtain the group velocity of these spin waves, we see that the, the limiting velocity in this uh, specific material is close to 20 kilometers per second. And the spin waves with these wavelengths of around 100 nanometers to which we are sensitive, they actually have speeds or group velocities which are already close to 12 kilometers per second, which is twice the speed of sound, for example. Or uh, if, you would like, if you would like to compare it to um, magnonics in YIG, these are also speeds which, which have, have never been obtained there. Now, a last thing as some, some sort of sanity check is, is to, to see if, if this, this hypothesis that we have, that is confinement of the excitation, which is the key ingredient to generate these uh, coherent spin waves, we can actually uh, confirm this by changing this confinement. So in the first experiment, we, we generate the spin waves by um, exciting the sample at the photon energy where the penetration depth is very small. And indeed, the resulting polarization rotation of the propulse shows this 225 gigahertz oscillation. Now we're changing the pump photon energy. So by going to a different energy closer to the band gap, we actually increase the penetration depth. So the, uh, the, the excitation is confined over, but over a much larger uh, spatial scale. And indeed, if we look at the resulting magnetic dynamics obtained in, a, in this geometry, we see that there is almost no signal. And if we now do this systematically, so if we, if we map out this spin wave amplitude uh, as a function of the penetration depth of the excitation, we actually see that there is a very strong correlation in which the spin wave amplitude is very large and we can easily observe it for small penetration depths and it goes to zero and as the penetration depth increases. And actually, um, if the penetration depth is on the order of the wavelength to which we're sensitive, again, this 140 nanometers, then uh, we get large amplitudes. Now, this brings me to the conclusions of this work in which we demonstrated the excitation of a, a coherent propagating antiferromagnetic spin wave packet by using strongly confined excitation. And we've used an optical detection method which has specific sensitivity to different spin wave modes. And in this way, we could map out part of this dispersion um, to, to both confirm the, uh, this, the sensitivity of the detection method and to confirm the presence of this wave packet. And thirdly, to, to refer back to this idea of antiferromagnetic magnonics, this really um, is, is, is a way to, or a platform to study coherent spin wave transport in antiferromagnet and also to, to study uh, how ultra-short positive light could be used in this process of generating and detect detecting these uh, phase coherent waves. I would like to thank all the other people involved in this work, both from TU Delft, uh, but also from other universities throughout Europe. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And I am happy to answer any questions in, in the question session during the conference. Thank you.